Well, good morning. It is so good to be back in your living room or wherever you're watching this today. Um, I want to get started by um, telling you a, a quick little story. Uh, I have a six-year-old boy, and my uh, six-year-old boy uh, has allergy issues. He is deathly almost allergic to dogs, and we discovered this early on in his life. And so we started taking him to, to different allergists and eventually started getting him allergy shots. He started when he was about three years old. He hadn't gotten a ton better, so there's not a lot of hope there. But when he was especially just beginning, he would pitch such a fit when he knew that we were going to go and get allergy shots. And so for the first few times, we would literally have to hold him down while he got these shots, screaming, yelling, snot flinging everywhere from the allergies, but also from crying because he's got to get the shots. And I remember this one time, it kind of sits in my memory. We had taken him to, to get the allergy shots. The, the doctor or the nurse who's giving him the shot gets the shot ready, and he starts just screaming bloody murder. And so I, I'm holding him down, and for, for those of you who have been through something like this before, you know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm holding him down, trying to, to force him to be just still enough so that they can get the shot in his arm. And he starts screaming, Daddy, I want to go. Daddy, I don't, have to, I don't have to do this. I just won't have a dog. And then through, through tears and through my shirt almost being soaked from the tears that he's been crying, he looks up at me and he says, Daddy, don't you care that they're hurting me? Now, that's a, that's a good question, isn't it? Because here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm his dad, I'm the one who he's trusted with his life. If I wanted to, I had complete power and authority to sweep him up off the, off the chair and take him to go get ice cream, didn't I? If, if I wanted to, I could have completely made the situation disappear. But what do you do when the people or the person that is supposed to be protecting you all of a sudden, it doesn't seem like they even care. I think for, for some of us this morning, if you're honest, you're asking that question to God. God, it, it hurts. God, don't you, don't you care that this is hurting me? How many, times have you, how many times have you asked that question over your life? God, don't you, don't you care that I'm overwhelmed right now? God, don't you, don't you care that I'm fearful? God, don't you, don't you care that I can't even go out of the house right now? God, don't you care about that family member? God, don't, don't you care that I'm staying awake at night worrying about this? God, don't you care? Don't you care that I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulder? God, don't you care that I'm, that I'm sick? Don't you care that I'm lonely? God, don't you care that I feel unseen? God, don't you don't you care? And so we end up asking God that question in the midst of pain. This morning, for just a few moments, if you'll allow me, I just want to talk from the subject of, God, don't you care? Because if you're honest, many of you have been asking that same question, even if it hasn't been out loud. I want to take a look at, at Mark chapter 4. And just to kind of give you some context for Mark chapter 4, uh, just before this, Jesus has been teaching in a series of, of parables. Jesus would teach in parables, which was kind of a, a made-up story based on real events that he would use to, to teach a lesson. And so he's been teaching this mass amount of people in these parables. His disciples, his early followers, were, were sitting nearby as he, as he taught these parables and so Jesus kind of turns the corner here in verse 35 that I'm about to read you. And he goes from teaching a mass group of people with the disciples there to hear to teaching the disciples a direct lesson that I think today, if you're asking the question, God, don't you care? I think it's going to resonate with you as well. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35, says this. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. So Jesus has been teaching. He tells his disciples, let's get in the boat and let's go over to the other side. So the other side would have been about a five-mile journey to a place where up until now, Jesus was widely un. Known. And so Jesus asked them, he says, let's get in the boat and let's make this five journey, five mile journey to the other side. Some of you this morning, if you 
could think back at your life. You've had some of those to the other side moments, haven't you? Those moments where Jesus asked you, God called you, God spoke very specifically to you and asked you to go to what felt like the other side. Maybe it was you were supposed to take a big leap of faith. And so now you've gone to the other side with Jesus. Maybe it was you needed to start a business. Maybe it was you needed to stop a habit. And you felt like God spoke very directly to you to form a relationship maybe. And so now you're going to the other side. Maybe it was something that you had to give up control of. And so it, while it was a big step of faith and it was a big thing for you to do it, you decided to go to the other side with Jesus. And so these disciples answer the call of Jesus, put him and welcome him into their boat as they go to the other side. You see, Jesus has been teaching the people and his disciples a lesson verbally, but now he's about to teach them something and allow them to put it into practice. Some, some of the people watching this this morning, it's time for you to put what you've always known into practice. You see, I'm all for Bible reading. I'm all for tuning into church or, or going to church. I think that's a really, really important thing. But there's, there's some people this morning and you've heard enough sermons. You've read enough Bible stories. You've read enough Bible verses. It's time for you to put into practice what you've been taught. And I think one of the great tragedies and one of the reasons why we as believers especially aren't having enough impact in our world today is because we've been listening to Jesus teach so much and we've never actually put into practice the things that he's taught us. Just like Jesus is with his disciples here, he will give you moments where you have to put into practice the things that he has taught you and you have to actually take the step, hear his voice and obey and go to the other to the other side. And so these disciples do this. And the Bible says that they take Jesus just as he was. I think if you're reading this story, you can kind of skip over those words, just as he was. But the disciples didn't ask Jesus to change his clothes. They didn't say, hey, Jesus, I'm sorry. You've been in that all day. You've got to change your clothes before you get in our boat. No, it's, it says they took him just as he was. And I think why that, why the reason that's important this morning is because some of us want to take Jesus the way we want him. And so what we do is we take, we take the truth of, of, of Scripture and, and we take little pieces and we try to fit Jesus into our lives and we try to make him who we want him to be. But the disciples, it says they took him just as he was. And side note, some of you aren't taking your life as it is. So what you do is you, you look at other people, you compare yourself to other people and how they're doing, you, you get on your phone and you start to scroll and you begin to compare and you begin to analyze. And so what you end up living is a life that God's called somebody else to live. My question to you is, are you taking Jesus as he is and are you taking your life as he is? Because if you continue to want the life that they have, and you continue to compare yourself, whether it be social media, whether it be the things they have or the things that you want. If you continue to compare yourself with their lives, you will miss the things that God has for you. Are you taking Jesus just as he is? Are you taking your life just as it is in the way that Jesus wants to participate in your life? The disciples, they welcome Jesus into their boat. And Jesus says, hey, I want to I want to go over to the, to the other side. Verse 37 says, A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. So this cushion at the front of the stern, just so you are the, at the front of the boat, was placed in a position where it was for the guest of honor. And so it was in the stern. And what it would have done, it was it had been placed in a way where the waves wouldn't crash over the boat and splash the guest of honor. And so that's where Jesus is. So it's, it's no shocker that he's, he's sleeping, but it is a shocker that he continues to sleep even through this dramatic storm. It says, the disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care? If we drown. So see if this sounds familiar. You've welcomed Jesus into your boat. He sent you to do something or he's asked you to take a big step that you weren't necessarily prepared to take, but you believed him for it. 
He asks you to go over to the other side. You have him in your boat. And now the wind and the waves are crashing. Now the stock market changes. Now a pandemic breaks out. You've trusted Jesus. You've taken the step of faith. And now the storm comes. And so what the disciples have done is they've taken Jesus as he is. He is in their boat, but now the storm comes and he doesn't seem present. And so they say, Jesus, teacher, don't you care, Jesus? Don't you care that it hurts? Jesus, don't you care that I'm drowning or I feel like I'm drowning? Jesus, don't you, don't you care? Have you, have you, have you ever been there? Because they can see Jesus in their boat. They can see him, but yet he is asleep and seemingly unpresent when they needed his activity the most. Have you been there? Have you, have you been in that spot where if it just it feels like he's asleep? Does it feel like if he is present, that he is checked out of your life? Sure, maybe, maybe he's busy everywhere else. But to you, he seems asleep. You know, you can, there's a difference between having somebody in bodily form present in a room and then actually having them there, isn't there? Like one of the worst feelings is, is to be sitting in a room with someone and it feels like they're somewhere else. That's, that's the way the, the, disciples, the disciples feel right here. And I would guess for many of you watching today that your question isn't, does God exist? But it's, does he care? And that is even a more difficult question to answer. Because for, for a lot of us, I mean, we can, we can look up at the stars on a, on a starry night. And, and we just have to believe that something bigger than us threw those stars in the sky. Don't you? Or if you've ever watched a, a newborn baby being born and you've seen the, the miracle of childbirth, you, you have to know that there's, there's, some, there's something out there that's bigger than you. And so for many of us, the question you're facing this morning isn't, is God present? It's, does God care? And one of the things that will shipwreck your faith fastest and my faith fastest is not asking God, are you there? It's asking God, do you care? In fact, I think one of Satan's biggest ploys in the church today is to try to convince us that because bad times come, because the storm does hit, that it means that God doesn't care. God, I know you're there, but God, do you, do you care? Before this, Jesus is teaching them a series of, of parables about faith. The disciples have, have heard him doing that. But what they've been hearing him say in this moment doesn't seem to be lining up with what he is he's doing. And the quickest way for you to doubt the love and care of God is for you to think you know what's best for you. You see, Jesus put the disciples, or he put himself in the disciples' boat this day, not so that he could protect them from the storm, but because he knew what was best. He knew they needed to see him act in a way that they haven't before this. That they needed to, 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 to feel his presence in a real way. That yes, they knew that he was there. But Jesus is about to demonstrate that he's not just there, but he cares. And some of you, you're struggling today and, 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 and you're asking, God, do you care? And God is saying, yes, but I want to show you something that you're not going to see if I don't put you in the storm. If I don't allow you to feel the storm, you're never going to feel my compassion. If I don't allow you, 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 you to go through that, you're never going to understand me as provider. If you never have a need, you'll never seem as provider. If you never have sorrow, you'll never seem as comforter. And so sometimes, yes, God cares, but sometimes he allows the storm to come into our lives anyway. And this storm that these disciples are facing, this is a... This is a big storm. As a matter of fact, the storm that Mark describes here is a storm that's so big, it would challenge the, 
the confidence of experienced fishermen. That, that's the people Jesus is hanging out with here. He's not hanging out with some elite group of people. He's hanging out with some fishermen. And so this actually tests their faith. And so we know that this is, this is a real storm. Like this is real stuff. In fact, most people will say that the way that Mark wrote his, his gospel was based off of the telling of Peter and how Peter told his told his stories about Jesus. And so what we know is that Peter is the source for Mark. And so Peter goes into some, some, some heavy description here describing this storm because this is real to him. And I think somebody today needs to hear that, yes, your storm is real. It may seem minor to a lot of other people, and you may have been dismissed because because people said it wasn't that big of a deal, or they said you're too young, or they said it's just this, or they said it's just that. But your storm is real to you. And I want you to know today that God is not just there, but God cares because you care about it. God is so compassionate towards his people. He is so compassionate to you. If it's a storm to you, it's a storm to him. This is a real storm even these fishermen, even Peter, loud mouth, foul mouth, Peter gets scared by this storm. I can't imagine this, that Peter was scared of very much. Can you? But yet it says that they, were, that they were fearful. They knew because they had seen him that Jesus could do something. But in this moment, they're fearful because they wonder if he will. So he does. Verse 39 says he got up. He got up. If you have your Bible sitting beside you, highlight that part. He got up. That's an important, important part. He got up. Those three words are essential. If you're struggling this morning with asking the question, God, do you care? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Those words literally mean be muzzled. In other words, he looks at the waves and he says, hush. It says, then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Jesus got up. For some of you today, you need to hear those words he got up because the things that you're facing the situation you find yourself in, that marriage that seemed so stable a year and a half ago, that job that you never thought you would lose, you never thought you would be the one laid off, that sickness, that, that diagnosis that you've just gotten, you're asking yourself, God, do you care? Are you even there? I want you to know this morning that he always, always, always gets up for his people. He is always fighting on your behalf. He always wakes up at just the right time for his people. You are never fighting the battle by yourself. He always gets up. He always has. He's always gotten up. Take a look at the course of scripture. The very beginning of the Bible, Genesis, Adam and Eve, Everything was perfect. The Bible says they did the thing that God told them not to do. Man fell at that point. Sin entered the world at that point. But what does God go and do? He kills animals and he, and he covers their shame. Fast forward a little bit. Abraham, God had made a promise to Abraham. And it seemed like God was asleep. Because the promise of a child wasn't happening. What eventually happened? Abraham, somewhere around 100 years old, he and his old, old wife. You think you're old? He and his old wife, they have a child that eventually starts an entire nation. What about the healing, the, the resurrecting of Lazarus? Lazarus has been dead. His family came to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, where have you been? Where you been, bud? He's been dead. You could have showed up before now, but what does he do? Jesus gets up, and in the process, he gets Lazarus up to fast forward even past that. Jesus, they had all of their hope in him. He was going to establish an earthly kingdom. They followed him. They loved him, but what happens? He dies at the hands of man, a willing death. They put him in a, in a borrowed tomb, and for three days, it seems like the story 
is over. But what happens on the third day? He gets up. You need to know that he is going to get up. It may feel like he's behind, but he's right on time. Jesus always, always, always gets up. He has enough power for what's paralyzing you. Jesus has enough power for what's paralyzing you. He has enough faithfulness for your fear, and he will get up. So there's really two storms in this story. One you couldn't see, could you? There's the storm of the, of the rocky waters and the boat going back and forth and the feeling of, of, of drowning. But I have to imagine that there's another storm in this story. That's the storm inside the disciples. And, and I don't know about you, but I feel like I can often handle the exterior storm more than the inside storm. Do you feel like you're, do you feel like you're going through a storm on the inside? Like, are you, are you battling those, those thoughts that maybe you've always had or maybe you thought you had shook those, those, those battles of being invaluable or being useless or those battles that you'll never measure up or things will never get better? Those battles of anxiety and depression or do you have a storm on the inside because this morning I want to speak specifically to you just for a moment and I want you to tell you I want to tell you that he doesn't just change the circumstances around you but he cares enough to change the storm within you he always 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 gets up it's in his character it's what he does he fights on your behalf he always gets up and he silences the storm. It may be a lengthy process that you didn't never want to go through. But he'll always, always get up. So the disciples' response is one that may surprise you, but I want to, I want to dive into it. Verse 41 says they, talking about the disciples, were terrified. I would imagine so, right? I mean, you've gone from Jesus, are you asleep? To whoa, what in the world did you just do? They were terrified and they asked each other, hey, hey, who is this? Can you imagine them whispering, kind of nudging? Hey, who is this guy? Like I thought I knew, right? But who is this? Even, even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, I, I think it's interesting, the question that, that they ask each other, that they ask, who is this? Because I, I have a better list of questions, okay? I, 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 in my head, they're better, okay? I know it's the Bible, it's perfect, but in my head, the questions are better. Like, my first question would have been, what was he doing? I would have looked at Jesus, and I would have said, hey, Jesus, did you have a good nap? Or the best question would have been like, Jesus, what took you so stinking long, right? Or... or or maybe I would have asked, Jesus, how'd you do that? I want some of that. Give me some of that. How did, how did, give me some of that storm stopping power, right? But they don't ask any of those questions. They don't ask each other any of those questions. And they don't ask Jesus any of those questions. Their question to each other is, who, who is this? Now, I think they asked that question not because they had forgotten Jesus' name. Keep in mind, they were disciples of, of Jesus. And so it's not like, They've forgotten over the, the last however long of, of terror. They haven't forgotten his name. They haven't forgotten that he was Joseph's son. They haven't forgotten that he was a carpenter. No, they, they, they ask, who is this? Because they're blown away because another layer of the, of the, the essence and the character of Jesus is opened up for them. Because they, they had always... They had always known, or they had known over following Jesus, that Jesus had the, the power to heal, heal disease, that he, could, that he could cast out demons. They had always known that he was a good teacher. They had just listened to him teach on the other side of the water where it was safe, right? But they ask, who is this? Because Jesus, in the midst of the storm, reveals another part of his character. He reveals the fact that he doesn't just have the power for everyone else, but he has the power for them. 
that he's not just there and he doesn't just care about everybody else, but they're saying, who is this? Because they see a new level of their character and their relationship with him. All of a sudden, it's gone from Jesus, you can, to Jesus, you did, and you did it for me. It's a concept they would have never understood had they not been in the midst of this storm with Jesus in their boat. Who is this? Who, who is this? All of a sudden, some of what he's teaching makes sense. We didn't understand it all before, but some of it makes sense now. Who, who is this man that has the power to not just act, but the power to act on my behalf? And I feel like somebody out there needs to hear this this morning. That God's power... And his care isn't just reserved for the holy looking people around you, but you can tap into it as well. That yes, he is there, and yes, he does care, but he also knows something so much bigger than what you know. Without a storm, his disciples would have never experienced the miracle of him calming this storm. So he does it on their behalf. Sometimes the pain has to come. Sometimes the storm has to come. Not because God doesn't care, but precisely because he does. God is there, and yes, he does care. So a couple of months ago, we took Riley to the allergy doctor for his shot, and he has gotten some better, and so he didn't stand up and try to, try to run out of the room or anything. But we asked the doctor, we said, is this, like, is this stuff working? Like, what's the, what's the long-term benefits? Because we don't want to continue to come here if, if he's not going to, going to get better. And with Riley sitting in the room, she looked at us. She said, yes, he's getting much better. In fact, one day, I think he'll get to have a dog. Why is that? Because his dad does care. I do care that it hurts. But I also know something that he doesn't. The joy when we bring that dog home, it's going to be incomparable to the terror that we've experienced getting those shots. And today I want someone to know, and I want you to hear me, and I want you to listen to me, and I want you to write this down. I want you to I want you to tape this to your mirror. I want you to put it in your phone, make it your background. I want you to hear this morning that God cares too much for you to just live an easy life. That he cares too much about you, that he cares too much about the eternity of your soul for you just to live an easy life going from one side of the lake to the other, never experiencing the storm. Because if you ask anybody who has endured the ups and downs of life and has walked through the other side and, and are people that you would consider people of faith, if you ask any of them, they would tell you it was the care that he showed me in the midst of the storms that I never wanted that got me to here today. And that's why I can go through unspeakable circumstances today with hope and with joy and with a peace because I've seen him do it before and I know he doesn't change and he'll do it right here too. God is there and yes, God cares. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us to endure the storms of life. God, all of those storms that the people that are listening to me right now are wishing away. God, I do pray that you would silence them. God, you don't let your children be in that forever. God, but what I pray is that before you silence them, 
God, that you would do something great with them. God, thank you so much that for many of us watching, we can look back over the course of our lives. God, whether we have a strong faith in you or whether we're just, we just happen to come across this, but God, we can all see those little things that couldn't have been coincidence. And we can see your care in our lives. And God, I pray today for the person that's hurting, for the person that's asking the question, God, do you care? Do you care that I'm hurting? Do you care that I'm lonely? Do you care that I feel unseen? Do you care that they're sick? Do you, do you care, God? I pray that right now just an overwhelming peace, that you would speak to that and say, quiet, be still. And that you would bring an overwhelming peace into their heart. God, help for them to hear you clearly. God, teach them in the midst of this. Show them another part of your character that they couldn't have seen any other way. And God, if there's somebody watching this right now that can experience that peace because they don't have a relationship with Jesus, God, I just pray that they would pray this, pray this prayer in their heart or they can pray it out loud and say, Jesus, I need you. I'm in the midst of the storm and you're not even on the, on the cushion because I have never welcomed you into the boat. But I, I repent. I, I say I'm sorry for the things that I've done that have pushed you away. And I, I believe that you're, you're the answer, that you came and that you died and that you rose and you defeated death. And I accept you. Come into my life and change it forever. God, thank you for an amazing church, for an amazing group of people. God, thank you for some amazing leaders and pastors of this church that love you and that are not willing to stop even in the midst of incredible chaos in our world but continue to make sure that your message gets out. God, thank you for the honor of teaching your word in Jesus' name. Amen.